In this video cast, we're going to look at confidentiality of information held by pharmacists. And that is a matter of both law and ethics. And the ethics is actually covered by the GPHC standards and the law predominantly covered by the Data Protection Act. So within this video cast, we're going to consider that act. Now, if we consider confidentiality, patients and others using healthcare services are entitled to expect that their personal information will remain confidential. Patients need to feel that they're able to discuss sensitive matters without fear that the information may be improperly disclosed. But health services cannot work effectively without trust, and that trust depends on confidentiality. But patients also expect professionals to act and to share information with other patients members of the healthcare team who need to cooperate to ensure the best patient care. So sharing of information is important as maintaining confidentiality. So it's really a challenge for the healthcare professionals. They have to succeed in both confidentiality and sharing of information to provide the best service for the patient. So what we're going to do is we're going to examine the legal and ethical requirements related to confidentiality. We're going to look at the main features of the Data Protection Act 1998. We're going to describe how the Data Protection Act affects pharmacy and then consider the Freedom of Information Act. So, um, as I already said, that the ethical considerations around confidentiality are covered by the GPHC standards and the legal requirements are set out by the Data Protection Act. In addition, the NHS has a code of practice on confidentiality, which affects everyone who works in or is contracted to the NHS, i.e. most pharmacists. So we'll look towards the end of the video cast around those. Now, the ethics, so the GPHC standards, confidentiality is covered by principle three, which is show respect for others. And a subsection of that includes the respect and protect patients' dignity and privacy, take all reasonable steps to prevent accidental disclosure or unauthorized access to confidential information without consent, unless required to do so by law or in exceptional circumstances. Further subsection um, details that you need to get consent for the professional services you provide and the patient information you use. A further subsection, use information you obtain in the course of your professional practice only for the purposes you were given it or where the law says you can. And those are all within the GPHE standards of conduct, ethics and performance and the guidance on patient confidentiality. Now, decisions made by UK courts together with ethical duties of confidentiality placed on pharmacists and other healthcare professionals have resulted in personal health information being treated with much higher degree of sensitivity than most other types of personal information. So there is a common law of confidentiality, and that's not codified in an act, but it's built up from case law. And the key principle of that is that information confided should not be disclosed further except as understood by that confider or with their permission. Judgments have also shown that information can be disclosed in the best interest. But this is very much on a case-by-case -case basis. And then we have the Human Rights Act 1998. And Article 8 within that Act says that everyone has the right to respect for his private or family life, his home and his correspondence. So this underscores the duty to protect the privacy of individuals and preserve that confidentiality of their health records. Any decision, decision to override a duty of confidence in the public interest must be consistent with the rights described in Article 8. The public interest served by disclosure must outweigh the public interest in protecting the confidentiality of the information. So if you believe someone's physical or mental state represents a danger to others, then you might have to consider breaching confidentiality. Then we have the Data Protection Act 1998, and that reinforces the position of both the common law and the human rights law by requiring all data processing to meet a range of requirements. Basically, compliance with the Data Protection Act should satisfy the requirements of common law and the human rights. Um, and the DPA, the Data Protection Act, regulates the processing of personal data. The key terminology in the Act refers to three people. So we have the data subject, so that's the person to whom the data relates, and generally it's the patient in the context of pharmacy. Then we have the data controller, so that's the person who describes how or for what purpose the personal data is going to be processed. So that could be the pharmacy owner or pharmacist. And then we have the data processor, so it's anyone else who actually processes the data. So it's anyone who enters data or is able to retrieve data from the system. They are known as a data processor. 
Now, the Act is administered by the Information Commissioner, who maintains a register of data users with the information being supplied by the data controller, who have to pay a fee. It's an offence to hold or process computerised personal data unless you're registered with the Commission. A notification must be renewed annually, but it will cover uh, any number of branches or addresses where data is processed. So, for example, a company only has to make one notification to cover all its stores. So in order to register the data controller, they have to provide certain information to the commissioner, and that includes the name and address of the controller, the description of the data being processed, the purpose of the processing, and other parties who have access to the data. Now, failure to comply with the notification requirements can incur a fine of up to £5,000 in the magistrate's court. Then the data controller have to comply with the eight data protection principles and they include personal data should be fairly and lawfully processed, processed for limited purposes, adequate, relevant and not excessive, accurate, not kept longer than necessary, processed in accordance with the data subject rights, secure and they should not be transferred to countries without adequate protection. Now, the Commissioner may refuse to register notification if they consider that the, the principles will be contravened. Um, the sections that are of most relevance to pharmacists relate mainly to the processing of data and consent. Now, the first principle has caused some debate over the years. Um, generally, no personal data may be processed unless either data subject has given consent or one or of a series of other conditions have been met. Now, of particular concern was the concept that patients should be automatically registered on a patient medication record without giving explicit consent. So they, they're they not necessarily asked simply by entering the patient's details on the um, electronic system for the process of, of dispensing a prescription. For example, you don't necessarily ask for explicit consent, but it is implied when the patient gives you the prescription. The Data Protection Act also imposes additional controls on sensitive personal data and this sensitive personal data includes any data around the racial or ethnic origin of the data subject, the data subject's political opinions, the data subject's religious beliefs and whether the data subject is a member of a trade union. Sensitive data also includes the data subject's physical or mental health or condition, the data subject's sex life, the data subject's offences or alleged Expenses. Now, if we consider data in, in the pharmacy, data processing is necessary for medical purposes, for example, prevent, preventative medicine, diagnosis, um, treatment and management of health services, and is undertaken by a healthcare professional or person working under the same duty of confidentiality, for example, a member of staff. Now, explicit consent isn't needed, but you should advise patients that you do keep records via patient um, medication records and also you can issue them with patient leaflets to um, inform them about this process and you must be prepared to provide a printed copy of the information that you hold. If a patient objects to their records being held it makes sense to remove it. One area where this isn't this cannot be done is if you keep records of private prescriptions electronically. In this case the patient cannot object to the record being made as there is statutory duty for it to be made. So, to summarise this point, virtually all personal data used in the pharmacy practice is sensitive, but explicit consent is not deemed necessary for PMRs, that's patient medication records, provided all personnel are bound by the duty of confidentiality. So, what happens if someone wants to see what information you have on your system about them? Well, Data subjects can ask for a copy of the data and be informed for what purpose that data is being processed and to whom it is being disclosed. Now you have to comply and with this request and supply a copy of the data. A charge of up to £10 for a computer record and up to £50 for an electronic record um, can, can, be, uh, can be requested and the re response must be made within 40 days. So generally speaking, you have to make the disclosure, but there are circumstances where you do not. 
A data controller does not necessarily have to disclose all the information they hold. Pharmacists can decline to, to disclose data if it would be likely to cause serious harm to the physical or mental health or condition of the patient or subject or other person. Generally speaking, the data should not be disclosed without the consent of the data subject. One exception is where it has been established that the data subject is incapable of managing their own affairs and the person requesting the disclosure has been appointed by a court to manage those affairs. So parents, guardians and carers may seek disclosure of information, but only for children where their age or health makes them incapable of giving consent. Pharmacists should not normally disclose information about adolescents to their parents, guardians or carers. Now, sensitive personal data can be disclosed for certain conditions, and that's um, in prevention or detection of crime, protecting the public against dishonesty, malpractice, mismanagement, and incompetence. Also, courts can order disclosure, or police or NHS fraud officers can provide written confirmation that disclosure is required for the prevention, detection, or prosecution of serious crime. Generally speaking, the requirements of the Data Protection Act do not apply to information relating to a patient who has died or to anonymised data. Um, Collation of data from patient records is allowed on condition that it is presented anonymously for the purpose of research or as information to commercial sources. Now, the issue of consent. Most patients accept and expect that health professionals will need to share personal confidential data if they are to provide the best care. Now, unwritten agreement between the patient and the professional uh, that allows this sharing to take place is known as implied consent. Now, examples of implied consent include doctors or nurses sharing confidential information during handovers without the patient's consent, or physiotherapists accessing the records of a patient who has already been accepted um, for a referral before a face-to-face consultation. The limitations of implied consent for sharing of information will include that if a patient has expressly requested information not to be shared, then it can't be. Um, It only covers those who are members of the team caring for the patient. And if the sharing of information is not directly related to the patient's health or social care, then it shouldn't again be shared. If in doubt, obtain explicit consent. So remember, consent must be legally valid. So patients should know and understand how the information is to be used and shared and should be aware of the implications of their decision, particularly when refusing to allow information to be shared is likely to affect the care they receive. So patients need to be provided with the full information before they make the decision as to whether they share or not share their um, data. And you must also deem that the patient must have the capacity to make that decision. So the DPA is concerned with privacy of individuals and the privacy of their data. Now, the Freedom of Information Act gives people the right to seek information from public bodies about how they carry out their duties, why they uh, make decisions they do, and how they spend public money. Now, requests for information under the Freedom of Information Act normally have to be met within 28 days. Generally, very few exemptions about what um, information can be requested Um, and personal data held under the Data Protection Act is exempt from the requirements of the Freedom of Information Act, which basically means that patient-specific information cannot be disclosed under the Freedom of Information Act. Now, in April 2010, the Information Commissioner's Office um, brought about the a system where they can start to impose fines of up to £500,000 for serious breaches of the Data Protection Act that are likely to have caused substantial damage or distress. Now, a fine will only be appropriate where the data controller deliberately contravened the Data Protection Act or knew or ought to have known there was a risk that contravention would occur and failed to take reasonable steps to prevent it from happening. Now, loss of data, which has been on the national press uh, quite recently, where organisations have lost laptops or CDs or databases. Now, with the Information Commissioners Act and the new powers to issue fines, pharmacists would do well with um, to review their data protection arrangements and to put into place systems to uh, to ensure that there is no loss of data and make sure those systems and processes are fully complied with. 
Now, if we take the GPHC as an example of a registered data controller, so there are controls on how they collect, store, and use personal data. So they make use of personal data to, to support its work around the regulatory system um, around pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, and retail pharmacy premises in, in Great Britain. The data can be shared with third parties in pursuance of the GPHC's statutory aims, objectives, powers, and responsibilities under the Pharmacy Order 2010. Um, and personal data may be processes, processed for purposes including, but not limited to, updating the register, administering and maintaining registration, processing complaints, and compiling statistics. Now, information may be passed on to organisations with a legitimate interest, including other re regulatory um, and enforcement authorities, NHS trusts, employers, universities, research institutions, and um, that's not an exhaustive list. Now, GBHC will not share your personal data on a commercial basis with any third party. You can, as a data subject, submit a subject access record and you will be charged a fee of £10. Now, I have also uploaded onto Duo the General Pharmaceutical Council guidance on patient confidentiality. So I'd recommend you definitely read that as well as watching this video cast.